Hello, hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome, welcome. Ready for uh, some fun cider drinking tonight? Mm-hmm. Cider is one of my all-time favorites, so I am very excited about this. And I've become a big fan of it thanks to you as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Hey, Andrew, how are you? I think you're on mute. There we go. I'm doing great. Nice to see you both again. Oh, we can't hear you. Hold on, maybe that's on, on my end. There we go, we got you. Fantastic. Nice to see you both again, is what I said. Oh, yeah, what's it been? At least a year, if not longer. We were just talking about the last virtual tasting where you joined us, but it was so much fun. Not but a blip, it seems, also. Um, I know. <laughs> things move fast these days. A terminal amount of time has passed and almost no time with the same breath. I know, really. So, well, welcome everyone. Um, we are here tonight. Andrew is the head cider maker and co-owner of Finch Our River guest Cider. Our owner. Yes. We are very excited to have him here. We're going to get started momentarily, but we have our three ciders here. If you got your Sip Scout kit this month, these are the three ciders you have in your kit. And man, we're super excited about these. We've been drinking Finn River Cider for quite a while. Um, i trying to remember when, when I discovered them originally. Um, but when I really started getting into craft cider, you know, there, there's the big farm to table movement you hear a lot of in, you know, the, the food, in the dining world, the yeah, food yeah. world, and then you sometimes hear about grain to glass and the distilling world and farm to glass. And as soon as I heard the story of Finn River, I was like, oh man, this is like real craft and really like supporting local farmers and having a farm at like a state there. They have a really cool story that you're going to hear a lot about tonight from Andrew, um, and we're, we're going to keep supporting them. And actually, Andrew, since we have you here, yeah, <laughs> had an idea in mind as to how we would drink these, what order, um, but sure. defer to you. So functionally, I feel like we should set the palate with Farmstead uh, and kind of get to that point of taste, taste like cider, smells like cider, tastes like apples, smells like apples, that kind of thing. It sets a good groundwork. Um, whereas the other two present, uh, sorry, my stash is behind me. The other two present uh, 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 adjuncts and and those adjuncts, you know, being uh, you know herbaceous botanicals versus uh, stone fruit, um, and they feel like deviations from a form. So my thinking is that we would start with something that is just off dry, uh, again apple focused, apple centric, uh, and then we would uh, follow that with a deviation into the dry hop, and then finish with the uh, poem and stone because it brings some of the wild funk as well as uh, a fair bit of peachy sweetness. Um, cool. Yeah, that's your order. Yeah. I support yeah, that, that, Evan. Yeah, that sounds great. We were we were debating whether we should do the palm stone first or the, or the second or the dry hop second. So great to and, get that recommendation there. And since the fresh hopped is yeah. new to us, we weren't really sure where to fit. Yeah, it in how the different it is. Well. We've had the dry hop in the past, but we're excited to try this this fresh hop tonight. So um, yeah, that sounds great. And yeah, and for those of you, you know, we talk a lot about tasting techniques and kind of what order to taste things in. And some of you, you know, you might be scratching your head saying like, wait a minute, I thought we often tasted dry to sweet, right? You kind of start with the drier things, move to sweet. And that is often, but there's a lot of different variables that you have to take into account when you're thinking about the tasting order, mm -hmm. one of which is sugar, you know, the sweetness level. Another is the alcohol level as yeah. well. So whether it's higher in alcohol, lower in alcohol. Another is, you know, funkiness or fruitiness or things that are going to kind of like take your palate in one direction and be a little hard maybe to bring it back from. Yeah. Um, and that's likely why maybe this more sour cider is kind of near the end. Yeah. Um, what if follows a cider is, is, a, is a very important component of figuring out the tasting order. What follows anything that you're tasting sure. and kind of trying to appreciate values and quality and so. Yeah. Um, but thank you for that, that input, Andrew. Um, and while you are all joining us, please feel to crack open yes, any and all of them yeah um and yeah the, the the order that we'll drink them in as andrew just mentioned here is the farmstead followed by the fresh hopped followed by the palm and stone um but and so we're actually going to take our second and third one and put them in a little ice bucket here just to keep them a little colder while we're talking but we will what we'll do is we off will like take the second one out a little bit before we think we're going to start drinking it right because you really want and, you know, Andrew, I'm sure you can talk to this better than I can, but, you know, you want your cider to be cold, but you don't want it to be ice cold. You want it to be kind of a little bit warmer, and it probably depends on the varietal. 
um, so that you can get some of those nuances and the flavors and the different things kind of going on there. I'm just going to leave these up as a reference for a moment for yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So should we pour <laughs> our first cider and yeah. talk a little? Let's get us everyone drinking here. Um, Why, thank you. You're welcome. And Andrew, we would love it if you could, you know, tell everyone a little bit about the cider that they're going to start drinking first, and then maybe tell us a little bit about your story becoming a cider maker. And then as sure. we continue to taste through these, we can talk more specifically about Finn River. And we may be jumping the gun just in case anybody hasn't attended one of these before. Uh, my name's Evan. I'm a certified cider okay. professional. This is Suzanne. She's the co-founder of the Crafty Cast. Wait, I'm, the, I'm not the co-founder. Who's, who's my co-founder? I'm sorry. You're the, <laughs> you're the president and CEO and founder. Who's my co-founder? Right yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So we're all about cast. celebrating and supporting craft alcohol producers. Absolutely. Like the lovely Finn River. Um, and, and many, many others. others. Yeah. And, you know, for those of you who are Sip Scout members, you got your nice little Sip Scout box this month with Finn River inside of it. So we are very excited about that. Um, and next month, what you have coming up is going to look a little different. We're partnering right. with a really fun company called Master the World Wines. Um, and our Sip Scout kind of sticker will be right on here. Mm -hmm. And so you'll be getting three different wines and some chocolates next month because we're doing a Valentine's wine and chocolate day. tasting for Valentine's <laughs> Day. Um, and it's also going to be, you know, they're all craft wines, but two of them are from out of the country. So we'll be kind of taking That's a little true. tour around the world. So we'll be traveling and eating chocolate and drinking wine for, for Valentine's Day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about that, but back to the yeah. program. Uh, cheers to all of you. Thanks for being here. Cheers. Um, and Let's, uh, yeah, let's kick it over to the, now, Andrew, you are not just the cider maker, you are a co-founder, right? Maybe that's where the co-founder <laughs> kind of blurted uh, out. Of <laughs> uh, to a certain extent, um, uh, I came, I think I showed up at Finn River in year two uh, of what they were doing. Uh, I was their uh, second cider employee, uh, <laughs> and there was a trio of our founders, and those uh, are Christy and Keith who happened to be married, uh, and then uh, Eric Jorgensen, who lives across the valley. Uh, and those three together kind of hit this vision up to produce a value-added product that would help save the farm. And so there's a lot that uh, speaks to Finn River about value-added product or you know, agricultural uh, competencies. The way that you can pay bills um, and be a farmer is quite difficult. And so historically speaking, you would say things like the first generation uh, uh, endeavors to buy the land, the second generation endeavors to pay off the land, and the third generation is the first opportunity that you would see uh, a profit. And so in this day and age, uh, those kind of legacies are even more few and far between. And so if you wanted to uh, uh, acquire agricultural land and then uh, talk to your investors and be like, so in three generations, we're thinking we'll be in a position uh, uh, to have you all paid back and then we'll be profitable. Um, that doesn't sound so good. And so we've been in a process in the last, say, like 50 years in the United States of redefining the finances of small scale agriculture. You see some of that in the farm to table action, um, trying to uh, uh, monetize more directly in small scale communities. But you also see that in the uh, uh, pursuit of value added products. And in this case, we grow some apples, we buy a lot of juice in as well, and we take and we modify or process or embellish upon what is grown on the land to give you something that is more than just the raw product. So it's not just the carrot out of the ground, um, but it's the carrot pesto that's packaged in a little jar that uh, uh, goes into your bistro, um, those kind of notions. And that is really what cider hits for us. It's a value added product coming from apple country. Yeah. And so this value added product we have used to start conversations on your dinner tables. And we have used it to reach out and talk about organic agriculture, small scale agricultural economics. And we've also used it to revitalize a small town uh, out here in uh, far Western Washington, where the economy used to be based on dairy and small scale dairy found its demise, you know, 45, 50 years ago, easy. And after that, you have a bunch of farmland that is functionally turned into hay bales. And that's about all the economy that's going on here. And so as we try and stimulate an economy, we needed a vibrant value-added product that was going to bring people in and, and, and really put a spark in them um, and give them something to talk about with their friends and their family, give them a reason to come out, give them a reason to come back, give them a reason to think about us while they're going through their daily life in the city. Uh, and so, yeah, 
Um, so vibrant, vibrant it is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So speaking of your vibrant product, let's yeah. talk a little bit about what we have in our glass right now. So Farmstead is uh, basically the taste of Chimicum Valley. And uh, we live in Chimicum, and that's where our cider house is and our orchard. And there is a, a group of people that are known as the Chimicum people. Uh, and they used to live and still do to some extent live in this area. Uh, and it's on their land that we farm uh, a 50 acre plot. And in that notion, as we talk to neighbors and learn about where we are and who we are and um, what we know of the land, everybody has apple trees in their yard. And so there's a lot of local fruit that's not being particularly used. Grandma and grandpa planted uh, apple trees to make applesauce or juice, you know, 75, 80 years ago. Uh, and now that fruit just hits the ground and it feeds the deer or it's a nuisance to mow over. And so we collect and talk to all the hobbyists and the old homesteads through in about 50, 60 square miles. And we're bringing in all of that fruit that we can get our hands on. And we're putting it together in basically a rustic taste of the valley. And that's what Farmstead is meant to be. Uh, okay. It's unfiltered. It clarifies pretty well on its own, just sitting in the bottle, but there's a haze to it. Yeah. Uh, we don't do a lot. It's, it's a rather non-interventionalist cider. We're not uh, in there manipulating with clarifying agents. Um, we're, we're not uh, throwing oak staves in to build complexity. We're letting the apples show through. Um, in this case, we're not even pitching yeast. We're letting spontaneous wild yeast that show up on the apples themselves uh, do the fermentations for us. So this batch of cider is made in three or four separate fermentations each year, to kind of depending on the season, but you get apples that come in uh, early on in, in, in late September, and we'll press those early fruits. We'll let them ferment on the side. And as they ferment through, that tank kind of comes to conclusion and it's just chilling on the side, but apples are still coming in. And so we'll press the next round, fill up the next tank, let, let that produce. But that's naturally a different blend of apples. And so as we put all of these things together, I think this year uh, we counted 72 different named varieties of apples that we know for sure are in this bottle. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so this is really kind of more akin to, to wine making in the sense that, you know, the what's going in there every year changes and it's all different things, you know, sure. and it, you're very dependent on. And the native yeast too is a kind of akin to kind of what natural wine is doing. And that's, you know, and so it's nice because I feel like people sometimes expect with, with all different beverages, you know, things that taste the same every year, right? But like, oh, you sure. don't expect that necessary from winemakers, you know, from winemakers, you know, you like this winemaker, you like what he makes and it's going to be different every year, but you trust it's going to be good, right? Yeah. And that's kind Perfect. of this approach Perfect. that each vintage almost is kind of. And we'll take efforts to romanticize each vintage so that there's not good years and bad years. There's just different right. years yeah. um, by all means. Um, and then uh, it, it also seems sometimes it's not so much dependent on the weather. Uh, or, or the factors of earth that decide what shows up in this vintage, but it has to do with uh, which old timers found it in their hearts to call me and tell me about their apples uh, and who showed up in the parking lot with, you know, uh, uh, 45 uh, bins uh, yeah. in the back of their minivan. And those kind of things do impact. So when there was a, a woman who lives near Paulsbo, which is about 30 minutes south of here, uh, and she is really proud of her Akane apples. Um, and they're these little red eating apples. They're delightful to eat. I never thought much of them for cider. She showed up and she was like, these apples, they are the best. And she thought so highly of them. She was like, you've got to be able to use them. I've got way more than I know what to do with. And for all of those uh, intents and purposes, it's one of 72 varieties inside this uh, sure. glass. Uh, but from her perspective, the value and the joy of donating fruit into this particular vintage. Uh, and so now we have a cane in here. And cool. it has a, a little bit of red veinage that comes through the flesh. And so we get a little bit deeper color from that fermentation. We're building complexity and we're building a taste of the land from people who live here. That's amazing. Um, it's almost like a terroir of community, you right. know, rather than like a terroir of land, you yeah, know, whatever, the, whatever that word would be. The circumstances of the weather are compounded by the circumstances of the outpouring or just like the call to action that I think is one of the coolest Thing that Suzanne and I talk about when we talk about Finn, Finn River is, is your interest in cultivating this, um, I guess, just curiosity about the land. And mm -hmm. if you have some apple trees on your on your land that you're not really sure what's going on there, yeah. uh, you know, you guys are a resource for people that, that you know, you may be facilitated inculcating that curiosity to begin with. And so as a way to bring that to light and be like, this is, people can share that now with people yeah. uh, that they know and their friends are like, these are 
some of my apples are in yeah, this. It's very cool. That's yeah. so cool. And that happens. And I have to clarify that we don't trade cider for apples, and <laughs> that we don't deliver cash in the parking lot, and that we build relationships um, uh, around stewardship. I need to know that these management practices from various neighbors and stuff are, are meeting at least with wild harvested untended standards. Uh, the rest of our product line is uh, uh, fully sourced with organic fruit and organic inputs. Uh, and so we, we do that homework. Um, and, and in that, I feel like we're building the or rebuilding maybe the culture of agriculture. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're proving that there is a viable network and there's a reason to be productive on what land you might have or what trees might be in your yard. Uh, it's, it's not just to, meant to be mowed over. Uh, and we can also support, we, we talk to tons of people about their orcharding techniques. Inevitably, a load of people want us to come help them prune their trees every year in the spring, uh, which we do not do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for that same notion, um, we are building the interconnected web of community, and we're doing it by putting some value on some apples. Some people donate. To that end, people do donate apples into this and we're a for-profit company we are trying to make money make payroll all that kind of good stuff uh and so the farmstead is also um, a fundraising bottle and we take 10 cents per uh bottle sold uh and we compile that up each vintage and then we donate that to a local nonprofit. uh i think most recently it's gone to jumping mouse which is a program here in port townsend that uh focuses on uh, uh therapy through play for kids and in the past, it's gone to Dove House, which is a women's crisis shelter, uh, and then also to the Community Wellness Project that it's uh, uh, pushing for nutrition in our local uh, public school district and, and changing the way soda machines and uh, food menus are put together. Wonderful. Well, and so we're taking in uh, what we do take in on donations. Um, we're flipping that right back around and putting it directly into our community at places that we think matter. So there's the value right. statement, right? That's, That's amazing. Yeah. Hey, Andrew, how did you, um, how'd you get into cider making? How, mm. how, how'd this, yeah, what's your story? Yeah, how'd this start for you? Um, so out of high school, I went to culinary school um, okay. and I got trained up as a cordon bleu chef. And so I started my, my life uh, uh, or my adult working career uh, cooking in fancy places in LA, Beverly Hills, that kind of notion. And as I transitioned out of that, I went to Humboldt State uh, realizing that I certainly wasn't going to work in kitchens for the rest of my life, and I didn't see a great future there. And so I made a little transition um, called college. Went to college and studied botany, fungal ecology, organic chemistry, uh, and spent, you know, 10 years taking more credits than was ever necessary to, uh, to graduate, and um, promptly took all of that information and went out to upstate New York and started picking fruit for a living. Um, <laughs> As my parents were thrilled, I'm sure. As my parents pointed out, that qualified me as downwardly mobile. <laughs> um, and, you know, they're into it. So I, I was uh, living out on the uh, East Coast in upstate New York, and the people I was introduced to there uh, happened to be some cider makers that are making like boutique, exceptional, top tier French style cider with really specific apples grown in the Finger Lakes region of New York uh, and, you know, trained by French cider makers and super like creme de la creme kind of cider. Uh, and I showed up and they were like, you want to pick cherries? I picked cherries. I picked apricots. Then I picked peaches. And then it was apple season. I picked apples. Uh, and then it was like, we need to squeeze the apples. And then we needed to bottle the apples. Uh, and then we needed to sell them. Uh, and then it turned out that I had some reasonable skills in uh, salesmanship and taking them into New York City. And so I spent my early years in cider being a grunt on a full, uh, full process farm. And then, yeah, empty that bottle into the pint glass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, so I spent my days uh, uh, convincing New York chefs in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx primarily uh, that cider was real that alcohol could be made from, from apples uh, and that there was space on their menu to offer diversity to their customer base and that this was a legitimate cultural phenomenon that was occurring in the United States. This was back maybe 2006-ish uh, or so, maybe a little 2004. And I regularly spent time at a farmer's market articulating the idea that yes, there was alcohol and no, I was not just selling juice. Uh, yeah. And since then though, um, I've moved. Uh, we came back to the West Coast, my wife and I, uh, and yeah, we, you can't build up that original cider house all that much and not tell us the name of it. Oh, but, sure. Let's go. <laughs> Eve's, Eve's Cidery, like uh, oh, yeah, Adam I and Eve, Eve's Cidery. Uh -huh, that's Eve Cidery. Autumn and Ezra, 
Um, they're cool. phenomenal people. They were great mentors. Uh, my baby was born on their land uh, down by the creek. We lived in a cabin uh, and spent, you know, the first two years of her life there, uh, dipping her toes into the creek that runs right through the, yeah, helping them plant cool. orchards and also, your, your, your story is making all of us want to be, be you. Yeah. Like, it, sounds, it sounds like a great um, life story right here. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, I wrote a letter to all, let's see, at the time there were 14 cider houses in Washington State. Uh, and so I wrote a cover letter uh, and was like, yo, I'm looking for a job. I'm better than a grunt. And I know things about cider and apples. And I have management skills, uh, which is a whole nother tangent that we don't need to get into that. Um, but I'm a management theory geek as well. Uh, and so in thinking about systems and management, uh, I applied for a job to every West Coast cider house. My parents live in Olympia, Washington, uh, and we were trying to get back out to the West. And Finn River is the only place that called me back. Wow. Uh -huh. Well, I should say Dragon's Head over on Vashon Island. Uh, they wrote me back, but they had an $8 an hour grunt, like entry level job for me. Uh, and this was back, you know, 2010. Eight dollars an hour was legal um, in, in Washington. It wasn't wasn't terrible, uh, but it was not enough to build a family on, and it wasn't quite what I was looking for. And, and so we came out and stayed in a cabin of Christy and Keith's out here at Finn River. Uh, and I started, you know, a week and a half later, and we've been building our lives here ever since. Cool. Super cool. That sounds great. Yeah. So. Um, and their loss, all the other side of your houses <laughs> that didn't call you back. Now they're kicking themselves. <laughs> Now I sit, uh, I'm a vice president of the uh, Northwest Cider Association, uh, volunteering on their board, uh, and I've been uh, working my way as an ambassador for the category for some time. So those folks who may remember my application initially, um, they sure see a lot of me now. Uh, yeah. And I'm helping uh, their boats rise in this tide as well. Yeah. Yeah, we know Jana over at the Northwest Cider oh. Association very well. Yeah, yeah she's, she's, awesome. she's amazing. For sure. Did you know her history with Finn River? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I knew her back when she worked at Finn that's River. Right. I think that actually that's, that's how I found out about Finn River. I think I met her at CiderCon or something and oh, that makes great fell sense. in love with her and we were like besties immediately. And then, you know, I learned about you guys that way. Yeah, that's great. Yep. So uh, I want to give um, our guests a chance to ask some questions and jump into the conversation and just say hi, maybe um, if you want to unmute yourselves and say hello. And Jay, you're in Washington. So I don't know if you're familiar with this area, Finn River, anything like this part of, you know, Washington, or if you've been? I have no idea where I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, uh, it, it is sort of a social crime that I've lived here as long as I have and haven't been able to really ex uh, explore the way I should. Um, but uh, one thing I have discovered while I'm out here is that there has been a lot of ciders and stuff. Um, and there is a, uh, a cider place just up the street and, and they do a little brew uh, in there. And it's all heavy metal based um, mead and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so. What's the, name, what's the name of that place? Um, I knew you were going to ask me that. It, it's, it, it's something Nordic and I, and I can look it up here okay. in a second and cool. circle back. Cool. Yeah. I was about to mention that heavy metal place in Denver, but yeah. I knew that if I did, someone would ask me what the name of it was. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember either. So. Oh, yeah, I remember <laughs> that place. Um, yeah, well, from what I've seen in pictures and from what I can tell of where Finn River is and what their property looks like, I would highly suggest a, a road trip there because it's on one of my very high. It, it looks just idyllic. It looks just beautiful. Yeah. And yeah, I remember yeah. visiting Olympia National Park when I was young and it was just like another planet. It's a really remarkable part of the part of the country. Almost stepping on a banana slug that was actually the size of a banana. <laughs> oh yeah. Wow. That, that's normal. Yeah. Um, it's, wet. Tuesday. it's wet out here. Um, no. I mean, it, it rains a lot. To have slugs that big, you need a lot of moisture. Uh, and, and we get it all the time, often in June. Uh, and so, yeah, everything is incredibly green. If you're lacking green, come for a visit um, and just breathe in the deepness and the aroma of, of green trees and green grass and the forests abound. Um, it is pretty glorious out this way. Yeah, uh, we're, I, we'll have ahead. to come visit in the summer because we live in Arizona now, which is the exact opposite of all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the summer. If you want some red and some dirt and some dry, Come on this way. <laughs> See, Andrew, just out of curiosity, while we're on this topic, um, 
given that you know the the temperate rainforest there on the Olympia Peninsula is as wet as it is on a global scale by comparison, how does that influence in your like in your experience dealing with the apples that are grown there to what you saw in New York? Hmm. Yeah. So we still, you know, being in a, uh, a, we're in a coastal climate, right? We're uh, uh, surrounded by ocean. So we're, we're pretty moderate. And yeah, we get a lot of rain, but we also have like not too hot and not too cold. Uh, so it, it's like wet and cloudy often, but we go nine months sometimes without rain in the summer. Uh, and so it, it does end up getting dry, but the temperatures don't tend to spike and things along those lines. So, and versus like back in New York, where like every three days you have a thunderstorm that bothers to actually come across your land, uh, whereas versus just seeing the thunderstorms in the distance, but you have rain during the summer. Uh, here we're dry during the summer uh, and we have a really long wet season. And so, sure, there's climactic differences. Here in uh, uh, Chimicum, we actually parallel um, uh, the Normandy coast, if you look latitude wise across the way. So we're, we're at this exact same maritime climate where uh, the English, you know, Somerset and, and in the south of England and places uh, where cider is known to come from, as well as in Normandy and Brittany on that coastline there, you have the same maritime climate, the same kind of uh, uh, what a cloud cover is really all I'm trying to say, um, that protects you and mitigates the climate. Uh, and so this is good apple country. And it's different than on the other side of the Cascade Mountains, this huge volcanic range. Um, and on the other side, you have Yakima and Wenatchee, the apple capitals of the world. And, and they're producing red delicious and gold delicious and uh, uh, honey crisps. And that's totally different than where I live. I live in a place that's full of lichens and little gnarly trees that produce a ton of apples on their own every year. Um, and that's the way the game plays. And so I feel like I live in apple country and across the mountains, they grow apples for commercial purposes with irrigation and a whole lot of sunshine. I live where apples want to live. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, we grow small, ugly bits of fruit. <laughs> I was gonna say Eastern Washington can't be a place where they grow without irrigation, right? Like that just doesn't make sense. No, not a lot. Not that I know of, unless you're in a valley, you know, the Okanagan Valley going up north uh, that stretches up into Canada. Uh, I wouldn't want to be arrogant and be like, that's not possible. Sure. But, um, no, drop... always never in things like this. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, a lot of irrigation. We irrigate here too. We grow some small trees. They need some support. Um, we irrigate for probably three to four months out of the year uh, where we're giving, you know, trees a, a gallon of water a day, something along that, that line. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not that huge, except that we have 6,000 uh, trees. Um, <laughs> and so um, there are some impacts. The Jamestown Sklallam tribe out here uh, on the Olympic Peninsula, they have done quite a bit of climate research modeling. And so their scientists, the tribal scientists, um, have produced some documents that tell us in the next 10 to 15 years, we should expect less snow and more rain. Uh, and so warmer winters with larger amounts of precipitation um coming during those winters and so we should expect wetter uh, uh conditions and then longer dry times and we're going to get more of this concept of a lot of water all at once and then a dry period and so we've been looking at ways in our orchard to mitigate that how can we trap water in the land how can we trap water in the root zone climate resilience for us uh has to do with understanding what it is that we need to support these trees when we have a bunch of fluctuation uh, and what we need is stability. And so we're designing stability into the orchard out here. That's big time. Yeah, that's super important. And you know, as Mother Nature continues to change, I feel like everywhere across the globe, uh, farmers are going to need to continue to understand how they can adjust and adapt. Because, yeah, you know, if it snows, then the water melts and goes into the groundwater much more slowly. If it rains, it goes into the rivers and goes out to the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just something that you can't really adjust for unless you have infrastructure in place and are prepared for it by having cistern or water yeah, collection right. parts of your topography that you can really hold it there. We looked into a pond, for example, that would allow us to irrigate. Um, we use something like 5,000 gallons uh, per hour to irrigate our orchard like the water volumes for irrigation are enormous. And we're in a wet place and we have uh, uh, water rights to the creek that runs through. Uh, and we're one of a few, it's really highly regulated kind of space. 
and we have access to this amount of water. We talked about putting in a pond and we were thinking like, how big would the pond need to be to impact our irrigation schedule? Uh, and we came up with like three to 4 million gallons is the size of the pond we would need that would cover like 15 days of irrigation needs in the middle of summer, right? <laughs> so we're not putting in the pond. We talked about <laughs> um, what it might look like to put in a wetland or kind of a diversion from the creek to try and help with some natural habitat and let the earth hold a little bit more water here, a little slower. Um, but in, in those kinds of concepts about, you know, how do we deal with the heat dome? I don't know if you all remember the heat dome of two years ago now. It wasn't this summer, but last summer. Uh, it destroyed raspberries and black currants uh, across the state. It destroyed cherries. The Washington State cherry harvest was just totally trashed. Um, and that was because we had uh, in the middle of July, something like 109 degrees. Uh, Eastern Washington was up into the 120s. Uh, and that's like Moses Lake area where uh, a lot of apples and cherries are grown. And so a lot of agriculture got hit by that heat dome. Our soil dried out like crazy. So we take that and we're like, yo, we've got to put wood chips on the ground. We need to plant bigger trees that harvest their own water from deep roots. Uh, and we've got to get off irrigation because fundamentally uh, uh, we need stronger, more robust uh, trees that are going to fend for themselves. And we need some shade. And so we planted an orchard in the midst of our small orchard. We planted a big orchard. And so in 30 years, there's going to be huge trees like that you got to hug your arms around kind of trees. Those trees are going to be the apple trees of Fen River. Uh, and underneath them, you're going to have a big shady paradise uh, that can withstand the heat dome and conserve some water moisture levels in the ground uh, and support a variety of other farm operations. Um, cool. Really digging into the agriculture here. Uh, but like, <laughs> You know, life life feels real out here. We are very much connected to the earth, uh, and and how we choose to play the next twenty years seems quite paramount. It's interesting. Just listening to him talk about this a little bit is making me think of that documentary. No, yeah, it was that documentary movie, The Biggest Little Farm. Biggest Little Farm. Biggest Little Farm. Have you guys seen this documentary, Biggest Little Farm? It's it's really amazing. It's this couple who basically decides they want to go off the grid kind of and but the way they want to do that is to go build their own self-enclosed sustainable kind of farm where like everything is the whole ecosystem is supporting each other like the bee population is supporting this population and right like the, the right things are killing the right things and eating the right things and then birthing the right like and watching them do this on, on even like a small-ish scale you know is really quite fascinating to just understand how ecosystems work and things that we think are bad and critters and annoying like are so vital what, yeah, to like other parts role of role. the role like yeah, yeah, yeah. like it's, it's really it's i highly recommend it biggest little farm it's pretty pretty captivating yeah i mean um, like the beaver wars that we fight out here um let me introduce a second first, cider and then yeah, we'll yeah. talk about beavers <laughs> it's worth yeah, it. I just I, I just took a sniff of this and yeah, I was like, I was like, whoa. I was like, whoa, this is exciting because we've had your dry hops before. Um, but this is a newer cider, is it is it not? The fresh hop? Yeah. The fresh hop is just significantly smaller batch. Uh okay. I think it's cooler, uh, but we don't we can't make it year round because we only have you can only make it with fresh hops. And if we made it enough for an entire year's worth of sales, towards the end of that year, you would be drinking old cider. And that means oxidized hops, and it's just not what we want. So we yeah. make it in a pretty small batch. Uh, depends on what the growers bring in. We have one row of hops in our orchard out there. Uh, instead of trees, we planted hop vines. And then in the uh, you know search for fresh hops, there's a fella up in Squim, which is you know 25 miles west of us, and uh, he put in six different varieties of hops on a whim because that's what he's into kind of thing. And then he called me one day being like, hey, I got all these hops. You guys do things with hops, right? Do you want any? Uh, and that was the beginning of a relationship. His name's Carl. He generally drives boats from here to Hawaii and then apparently has this hop farm, um, which I've been to and it's great. And I don't understand all the whys, but nonetheless, um, I buy hops from him. And in this case, it's uh, Organic Comet and Cascade and Chinook, I believe, are the three varieties that you taste in there. We grew the Cascades, he grew the Chinook and the Comet. Uh, and we're talking hours from harvest to in a tank soaking in cider. Um, as soon as they get picked off and they, you know, they get brought in in a tub, uh, we're dumping them straight down. Um, and that is a, a, a direct infusion like of the land into the cider, bam, bam, bam. And so fresh hops, they're 
amazing and alive and it's herbaceous and more potent. We put a lot more hops into the fresh hop than we do into the dry hop, mostly because we buy all these hops and we're like, what are we going to do? We're going to make one really dope ass um, batch of cider and we pile it all in uh, and we try and make something that is just knock your socks off. So if you're into hops, this is a bone dry cider with a whole big pile of local hops uh, uh, dumped in. They sit for about a day, day and a half. Uh, and then we're pulling those hops out. Um, when I have a quiet moment, I'll try and load a picture into the chat, which I believe I can do, uh, of what our tanks look like when they're full of hops. But it's the kind of a mesmerizing field of green. Um, well, and it's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, that sounds great. This smells like a mesmerizing sea of green. like, And even has like a little bit of greenish hue to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's pushing it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it, and it's always... So it's fun. I, I really love hop ciders. There's, to be fair, there's a lot of bad hop ciders out there. So if you've tried hop cider, I feel like it's a very, it's an art a little bit, like how to bring hops to life in cider. And, and sometimes it just goes, goes bad. And this is beautiful. And your dry hop cider is beautiful as well. But I like hop cider specifically because I do think it's a way to get beer drinkers who have just like, for whatever reason, written off cider completely and said they're not cider people to at least be curious enough to try. And then once they get in, like that's where you can start to go from there, mm -hmm. you know? And I really enjoy that. Um, that's also how I talk about um, barrel-aged gin, you know? Sure. Get barrel-aged gin is the way to get whiskey drinkers into gin kind of thing, you know? Those kind of transition turns just in, what do they call those? Gateway. Gateways. Gateway drugs. Yeah. Or gateway. <laughs> <laughs> gateway booze. Yeah. That's what they told us in math. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so all those things you didn't know about until you took the D.A.R.E. program. Yes. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> I, uh, uh, in Ballard, there's a company called Big Gin. Um, maybe they're called Captive Spirits Distillery, uh, but, uh, but they make a product called Big Gin. Uh, and their head distiller, Alex, uh, has come over to visit a few times. And I just picked up a few of those barrels. And I have uh, some peat smoked barrels, like what you would make scotch with, I would imagine. Um, but he was making peat smoked gin or barrel aged peat gin. And then he handed me those barrels and I have two of those and we're now filling them with cranberry juice and perry. Uh, and so we're gonna have some peat smoked barrel aged scotch like cranberry gin kind of, mm. uh, and that is a collaboration that we won't see until the fall as it comes through. Um, but uh, uh, bit by bit, uh, working into that gin because I do think it's a gateway. People are like, oh, I, I like that gin. I like, I like that mezcal thing, what'd you do? Um, and so the crossover collaborations also lead to a lot of that kind of gateway engagement. Um, For sure. A Andrew, how do we get on your, your tasters list? I'm like, how do I get a <laughs> bottle of that? I'm like, I'm not yeah. talking to make a new cider. I just want a bottle sent this way. Like they, cause they, that's the fun thing about Finn River too, is they have a very wide portfolio. Um, and honestly, I, I would say a lot of times when I find winemakers and other places that make kind of everything under the sun. I'm honestly not normally a fan of that because I feel like they don't make everything under the sun very well. Um, and I kind of like it when people focus in on like, I'm good at this, but Finn River is an exception to that rule because every cider of theirs I've tasted is delicious. And they do a really a lot of these cl classic traditional ciders, but then they do these fruit infused ciders and botanical ciders. And so they have different like categories of ciders and they're all just uniquely different. Just and to give you an idea and correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, it, it, year in, year out, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 distinct At least that are for sale. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think we have 25, maybe 30 standard SKUs. And then there's one-offs that kind of populate in there for sure. Okay. Yeah, people, keep, people keep bringing me these weird fruits. Uh, and, 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 you know, like, what do you do when someone walks in with like kiwis and golden currants and uh, uh, or the quince or, yeah, I mean, or the funky apples that show up. And, and this one fella who lives by, over by Anderson Lake, he shows up and he has Egremont russet apples. And like, I don't know why anyone would plant these trees or particularly grow these apples. They're a little bit mealy. They're kind of dry and cakey. And he shows up and he's got like a truckload of them. Like he's been intentionally growing these things for years. And he's like, I think you're going to like these. And it's like, yes, but what have you been doing before this? Like, why? <laughs> Um, and, and what in the world, like he doesn't even make cider. He's not, he doesn't even drink alcohol. And so he's growing these obscure apples for his, from what I can tell, no good reason. Um, until he met me. He has very happy fat squirrels. He has very happy fat squirrels. Yeah, like a pig farm or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I mean, so, so then I get those apples and we're like, well, what are we going to do? 
we're going to make something special. We're going to make something that uh, no one's ever had before, and we're never going to make it again because he passed and the people who bought his land cut his trees down. Uh, and so in terms of the number of SKUs, there are joys and there are tragedies, and we make things because the opportunity shows up. I would like to think that at the price point that we're at with or organic standards, salmon safe certified, um, the values commentary that Finn River brings to the table, um, I get it. We are one of the most expensive ciders on the market, by all means. And one of the reasons that we're most expensive is because we deal honestly with our neighbors. Um, and then on another level, uh, we put creativity and excellence into what we make. And so I would hope that we're not going to put, we might put out something that's weird and might not be the, the right taste for you, uh, but it's the right taste for somebody. And even if it tastes bad, it's, it's well-made bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we put our diligence into it and so uh, you might not like it but this is made exactly how it should have been made sure and we actually do talk about that quite a bit with, with in, in these sessions and in other classes that we do about being able to differentiate between is this a well-made product versus do I like it is really what you want to aspire to you know like you might take a sip of something and be like whoa that's not for me at all but that doesn't mean you have to say that's a horrible wine. Like that's a very different statement, right? Like, and Bingo. so you always feel like, you know, it might not be for you, but someone does like it out there. Yeah. Um, palettes, palettes are wide and variable. And, you know, and while Andrew says they're one of the most expensive ciders out there, I actually do find this to be very reasonable um, price point for some of the other ciders that, you know, are out there. The, the cider is a little bit more expensive than beer. Of the craft cider world. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, the thing I do love also about Finn River is that they ship all over the country. Um, so this isn't, you know, and we try as best we can with Sip Scout. We try to only bring you things that you would never maybe find out about otherwise, you know, on your own, but you can get more of it when we're done here because otherwise it's such a tease to let you taste it <laughs> once and you fall in love with it and you can't get any more. Just kidding. Um, but yeah, but they ship all over. And so I, I really encourage you to go to Finn River's website and I'll throw it in the chat in a second and just look around in their shop. You just choose the state you live in, look around the shop and see, because there's some fun flavors. There's some fun things that you won't see anywhere else that you just might be like, wow, that's super interesting. Um, also, I, I feel mean, like it's a fun gift as well. I got mad stories. Um, we're, we're a verbose company. We tell stories with our hops. We tell stories with uh, uh, the variety of ciders that we put to, and I don't mean to rush it, um, but should I talk about sours and talk about the next, or should we banter about other stories? I got, I got, I got other stories. I just want to know where we're feeling on timelines and like that kind of thing. Yeah, you maybe give us one more story, and then we can kind of jump into the third. And maybe the story can be uh, adjacent to what I was going to suggest as you bring sours into this mix, because um, I recall the last time we were with you and talking ciders, um, you had a pretty interesting kind of delineation mentally perhaps for yourself or perhaps to share with consumers about like the approach of looking at the farmstead uh this is apples and this is quintessential apples and you know we're really trying to show off apples and and this sense of place as much as we can as a closely related to the concept of terroir as you like to have that and then the other not half of your portfolio because i feel like there's probably far more of the botanical and the sour and the hop the ones that have the adjuncts as being something that is perhaps your uh, blank canvas to play around with and oh, yeah. uh, and kind of talk about uh, the 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 approach to those two sides from historically where the delineation in our culture was, which is beer drinkers and wine drinkers, and how you bring both of them into the fold at Finn River by having something that is true to the the primary ingredient. Form of apples yeah. apples in in the farmstead and the others in that uh you know so if there's a story that like kind of shaped <laughs> not to put you on the spot there <laughs> i got this i love this that good. i love that concept and so i'd love to know more about like the origin of that for you if there was a story uh -huh. like traditional so, versus contemporary a little bit yeah, I guess. yeah primarily speaking it's all about dogs and cookies um unless those are actually just ritz crackers and peanut butter that are happening um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm talking about you. <laughs> um, you're after my own heart. Um, the uh, I think the gameplay that you're getting at there, Evan, um, there are many old school traditions for cider making. 
Uh, they're primarily French and English and, and Spanish, and there's some German. But what it comes down to is on some level, like cider is a little bit punk, a little bit punk rock. Uh, it's a little bit DIY. Uh, it, it has the ability to not take the same infrastructure that making beer does. Uh, although I'm, I'm a reasonably avid home beer maker, uh, but also uh, uh, we don't have the pretense that wine brings to the table. And we haven't as a cider culture for 300 years. Cider has been a beverage of, of the campesino, uh, of the farm worker. Uh, cider is uh, the, the beverage that keeps your children alive because it doesn't, have, uh, doesn't bring dysentery. Um, cider has a lot of history of being a community beverage. And so, yeah, we're building, we're standing on those kinds of shoulders for sure. And uh, at the same time, there's an, uh, an idea of wanting to elevate. I want to make a 750 ml bottle of cider that pours like wine, that, that blows sommeliers off their chairs. Uh, I, I want to uh, show you the complexity of notes of leather and spice and the, the flavor of the clay-based soils that I grow in here in Chimicum. And at the same time, um, I also want to engage and be, this is hard for me to say out loud, at least a little bit connected to like tailgate parties. <laughs> um, like I, for one, I'm a soccer player and for, for two, uh, I'm in a premium organic cider, uh, and, and we, we don't hit that tailgate mark exactly, but bear with me on the stretch there. Um, I want people to drink cider and I want it to be delicious. Uh, I don't want to like exclude folks from the category because I'm making something so austere, uh, or so pretentious that, it, that is, uh, unreachable. Uh, and so we have that freedom in cider because the category is somewhat undefined in the United States. Uh, we don't have the rules like beer has where all these style guidelines um, that make a, a Bach or a Hef or a, a brown ale. Do we don't have- hmm, Sorry to interrupt. Do you think that's a pro or a con? I know, I feel like that's kind of hmm. how it's debate, debated within the cider industry. Like there's a lot of people who are really pushing hard for like defining what dry means, defining what, you know, and defining yeah. like modern versus traditional. Do you think that's- important? Like what's your thought on I, that? I think that uh, uh, having clear definitions for consumer communication feels really important. Like people need to understand what the product themselves, but uh, I think pushing for those definitions um, are also primarily notions of ego within the maker community. Uh, you know, like whether it's a Bach or a Hef or a Pilsner doesn't really replace the idea about whether it's good or whether I like it. Right? And those are different questions. Like, does it hit the style guidelines and does the, the, does the person enjoy it? Uh, and so I think, yes, we want some definition. We could use some clarity so that we can all compare each other to ourselves um, kind of thing. And that will probably lead to more connoisseurship and uh, uh, an elevation of the categories. Yeah, that seems beneficial. But on another level, like it, it's also just important to ignore the, the categories and make sure that you're hitting the, the yum factor, the deliciousness factor, because people need to enjoy it. And, and so if the cat, I, I wouldn't take category definition at the expense of, of consumer enjoyment. Um, and, and so those are, they're, they're not, they're, they're related, but, but sure. I, want, I want both uh, uh, fundamentally. Yeah. Equally, like, you know, in, in the south of France, um, or sorry, in the in the north of France, um, if you don't have the right ten apples, you can't call it Normandy style cider, appellation of control, right? Uh, we don't have that going on here in the United States, and we probably won't. I don't hear a lot of people pushing for that. Mm -hmm. We also don't really talk about terroir all that often in cider uh, because very few people are growing the same varieties of apples in different places. So you're not tasting the earth; you're tasting a different blend. Uh, and so there's some really uh, fun projects going on between cideries that are all growing Kingston Blacks or all growing Golden Russets. And, uh, you know, we put out three different Kingston Blacks last year, uh, one from Wenatchee, one from the Olympic Peninsula, and one from the uh, northwest side of the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, and so we had three different regions all growing the same apples, and we let them each ferment individually and tried to showcase the same apple from three different places. The fermentations tasted totally different. Did they? Uh, but why? Was that the earth? Was that the native yeast? Was that the fact that they came in two different two months apart and they fermented differently on our side? Like there's a number of variables to control from. Sure. Low data points, but interest and intrigue. 
And so in that kind of space, I don't know that I think it's important, but I think we're going there anyways. <laughs> and, and cider makers take their, their craft seriously and they want parameters and they want to know that they're hitting a mark. Yeah. And then the marketers, the people who sell the cider and, and speak to the customers, they also need parameters. They need to be able to talk about dry and sweet in a way that customers trust and believe. They need to be able to yeah. create that trust relationship. So yeah, like, yeah. That's the most harmful one, I think, is the dry and sweet. That's the one I feel I, I really wish they would regulate kind of because, you know, you put dry cider on something and it's not dry at all. And then people mm -hmm. are like totally turned off, you know? And so it, it really, from a marketing perspective, I feel like that's one of the most harmful ones that's not regulated. Yeah, that's challenging. Yeah. yeah. Jay, to the silliness that I'm spewing at the moment, um, the idea of tasting the earth is that terroir is a, com a term that talks about tasting uh, of the place. And generally in grapes, that refers to tasting of like the qualities of the soil that the grapes are grown in um, versus tasting to blend, meaning the blend of apples that have come together. And so are you just tasting the fruit and there are a little bit, there's differences between the physical thing that you're holding in your hand, or are you tasting the differences between the earth that the roots were touching? Um, and that's what I was trying to allude to in that particular statement. Mm -hmm. um, are, you, are you tasting the earth or are you tasting the apples uh, and the difference in the fruit? Um, terroir is not supposed to reference necessarily the difference in growing conditions. Like you irrigated your apples and I didn't irrigate mine. You'll be able to taste that in the cider. Uh, is that the definition of the word terroir in the wine con uh, concept? No. And so it's a little, yeah, it takes some metaphors to get through all of that, I think. Although to be fair, I guess I would like, if you're irrigating, your roots aren't having to go as deep and work as hard. So they're mm -hmm. likely not getting as much, like pulling in as much of the minerality or the the, t the things yeah. from the soil. They might be right? only going through like yeah. three feet of soil because they're growing up where the water comes from the irrigation as opposed to 10 feet of soil and seeing three different stratas that have a totally different content of minerals and nutrients. And that's, I think, why with Old World, they talk about terroir so much more because they aren't irrigating as much. And here in the United States, even in the wine world, I would argue, we don't really talk about terroir all that much. We use the word, sure. you know, but we don't talk about it in the way that like they do in Europe, you know? And I think that's yeah. irrigation related. It's adjacent, but it's not. Well, because the vast majority, like not only is irrigation not common, it's actually mm -hmm. illegal. Forbidden. In a lot of, places, in a lot right, of AOCs, right. at least, at right. least for wine. Um, and maybe in, maybe in cider, AOCs too. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, you know. They got them in France, um, and, and you see a little bit of that pushing in England. Um, I, I doubt you'll see it in the United States, looking at what the American Cider Association is bringing to the table. They're looking for a big tent solution. Uh, does, you know, I we work to brand Pacific Northwest Cider uh, relative to Michigan or Midwestern Cider up there in the North, the other apple, versus Finger Lake Cider and uh, the Northeastern world. Uh, and at best, we have consensus that um, we all have a bunch of dessert fruit and they grow a lot of Macintosh over here. And there's different apples that go into different places. Uh, they make more ice wine the further north you get. That all makes sense. Um, but stylistic choices are different than whether you're tasting the earth. We're not all growing the same fruit. And so the comparison of place-based, or like, like if we were all growing uh, Cabernet, you would compare the Cabernets across and I'm going to say it, and I was going to try not to say it, but, it, you know, comparing apples and oranges, um, there's it, just different stuff here. Uh, and so if you're not comparing across the board, then the comparison isn't, doesn't feel like you're actually talking about the earth, but you are talking about the stylistic choices of the fermenter or the farm or something along those lines, which is similar, but also not the same. Getting a yeah. little snooty, and I try not to get into the snooty too much. And it's hard too, because like, Geographically speaking, the, the places where grapes are, I'm sorry, where apples are being grown in Europe. Oranges. In, yeah, oranges. Uh -huh. in, in the UK and in France and in Germany, collectively, all of those areas combined are like half of the entire United States. Mm -hmm. And we're growing them all over the United States. Mm -hmm. And so unless we were growing the same apples uh, that France was growing in Normandy and Brittany in, in Washington, and that was the only place you were growing those apples in the United States. It doesn't really make sense to draw comparisons to, you know, European examples of those apples. And the same would go for, you know, growing the UK apples in the Finger Lakes and 
you know, the Spanish apples in Michigan. Sure. It doesn't really make sense to draw yeah. comparisons across. It, the same way it doesn't make sense drastic. to compare French uh, ciders to Spanish ciders. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I know I took us on a tangent there for a second. Sorry for the interruption. But while we're while we're waking our way back from the tangent, maybe we can pause for a second to introduce our, our third cider here. Yeah. Uh, so home and stone, uh, home fruit is the uh, botanical term to refer to apples and pears primarily. Uh, poems is a botanical term. Uh, and then stone fruit, uh, referencing the peaches, the nectarines, the apricots, the plums. Uh, and this one in, in particular uh, uh, focuses on apricots uh, because that's what came in from the uh, grower that I work with. And I tend to buy all of their ugly fruit. And sometimes their ugly fruit is cherries, sometimes it's peaches, sometimes it's apricots, but I give them a viable market for the fruit that is uh, uh, not going to make it to market. So, so I give them a viable financial alternative to what won't make it to market. Um, right. And and that secondary uh, economic cycle is like the heart and soul of Finn River sourcing and apples. It's not that we're buying waste fruit, but we're we're giving a market and a viable pathway for all the things that the consumers won't buy in the grocery store. Uh, and to me, I call that ugly fruit. Um, but uh, uh, to others, you know, it's not that it's bruised and beaten and terrible. Uh, these are things that have very slight blemishes that the American consumer won't pick up in the grocery store. Because fundamentally, when you go to buy a tomato, you don't want to pick up a tomato that already has a bruise or a wound or a little bit of mold growing on the top. You're going to pick the perfect tomato. So what happens to all those other cast aside tomatoes? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, they're in your house, Jeff. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Out um, the window. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, I, I often look for the, the discount produce bin, by all means. Um, and I also do that at Fin River. Um, and so I talk to the farmers ahead of time and I get field run cherries. Uh, in this case, I get um, apricots that uh, are picked and, and they process and freeze them for me. Uh, and so everything that uh, doesn't go to their fresh markets uh, gets dropped into a bucket and frozen, and then I get to buy it, and I have it year-round, and so I can make things at different times. The Poem and Stone also has like a fermentation history that is worth a little discussion. Um, we, uh, well, I we have make... to just tell you, when I took, a, I, well, when I took a, my first sip of it, you were, you were talking, so I whispered under my breath to Evan like, oh, man. <laughs> it's, it's really... Like this is super fun. I mean, all three of them where I haven't, we haven't talked about what we thought about all of them. We can talk about mm -hmm. that after, but the color on this is just beautiful. And they always say you eat with your eyes first. And oh, yeah. the, the texture is a little bit like richer and like heavier feeling. And it just, it's really well balanced. Like, and I'm, I'm, I like sour things, but I don't like them to be overly sour. And so this is really just beautifully balanced. Yeah, it's remarkable. So when we're talking about sour, we're not talking about tart or acid levels, particularly. We're talking about uh, alternative fermentation organisms. And so while the other two ciders we've tried tonight, we ferment with a, a pretty normal fermentation yeast, uh, a Saccharomyces blend. And uh, we, we get wine, we get alcohol as they consume the sugar and all of that's normal, normal. For sours, uh, there's a beer tradition in which you let uh, a variety of bacteria dominate your fermentation and multiple organisms can make alcohol. Yeast happens to be the best at it and the most consistent. So when you enter into the sour world, you enter into the wildness of uncontrolled bacterial fermentation. And it's glorious. It's not kombucha. Just pointing that out. Um, in the uh, uh, idea here, so we pitch, pitch meaning I add to the cider, uh, organisms that are traditionally considered flaws and, and dangerous to have in your wine or in your beer. And we do it on purpose. And so it's controlled mayhem. It's, um, it's playing with things that are terrible in order to make them so terrible that they're good again. Uh, and my wife told me to stop making the, the alpha and omega Christian thing. Um, and, and I'm going to do it anyways. But it's like these things are so bad, they're good. They come around again. They are the alpha and the omega, which is a quote. And that's where it gets into the thing that she tells me not to bring up because it's not that funny and things along those lines. Um, but like so bad, it's good. 
doesn't give the same notion as like complete circle. You start off with something like Brettanomyces, which is an organism that destroys red wine uh, uh, and makes it unpalatable. And you take it as a threshold level, you ferment it, you get it over and older and older and stronger and stronger. And then all of a sudden it comes back into a world where people are like, ooh, that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> that's, that's so nasty, it's great uh, kind of notion. Um, so that's the realm of sour beers. Um, they're so flawed that they're delightful. Uh, it's interesting and, because Evan, as a trained sommelier, he he has historically I had struggle. an issue with sour beers because he's like Brett beers, yeah, and natural wine, and a lot of sour ciders and sour beers. Yeah, he's like, I was taught that this was a flaw, kind of, but in Our, other contexts, it's hurdle. not, you know, yeah. But now mm -hmm. I like the smell of Stilton in my apricot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, genetic predispositions. We all taste things differently as well. Um, and so what is a flaw and what is that threshold for one is not necessarily going to be a threshold for another. Uh, and so there's definitely variation to play with. But in the notion here of cider, so we are presenting flaw organisms into the cider to get a fermentation. They don't do a lot relative to flawed red wine or sour beers. Uh, our sugars that we present in the fruit are really easy to ferment. They don't cause the crazy, crazy flavors that you get in sour beers, and they don't cause the same detriment that you see in barrel-aged old red wine. And so we're not burning down the cidery because we uh, uh, have an infestation of Brettanomyces. I, I buy the cultures in little vials and I add them intentionally. Um, and we don't worry about sanitizing afterwards. It's, it's never been an issue. There's not enough here to really engage in the same notion. Um, so we have some leeway in the world of sour or alternative fermentation organisms uh, that wine and beer don't have. Um, and so I play with that. We push it and we push the limits. Uh, I try not to experiment on my customers. Uh, we, we experiment in-house and we try and present excellence to the world. Uh, and so the weird funky ferments where Brettanomyces or Pediococcus, this other bacteria, have really come into full effect we've decided to control them and figure out what makes them taste good as opposed to showing you all of the weirdo nasty things that we can ferment in the corner. Um, and so poem and stone is something that we've returned to over and over again. We start off with kind of a wild and funky fermentation with a lot of organisms all growing together to make uh, alcohol for us. And then right at the end, we uh, dump a bunch of fresh stone fruit on top. And so by adding it at the end, it's not a co-ferment, but it's a finishing choice. So this has been finished with apricots and some nectarines and I think five gallons of plums. It gives it so much color for just a finishing ferment. It's yeah. really, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful. Sidebar for those of you following along, when he said <laughs> burn down the cider house, that's not an exaggeration in the mm -hmm. wine world because, well, he's talking about like mixing the right amount of this, you know, starter yeast or this starter yeast and then pitching it into the fermentation. Once the yeast is in a location, it goes on living there in the like air naturally forever. in perpetuity. You literally would have to burn down the winery or cider house or brewery if you didn't want a chance of Brettanomyces getting in your mm -hmm. fermentations from that point forward. It's like if you got glitter somewhere in your house. <laughs> yeah, just burn it out. Yeah, Brettanomyces. <laughs> Yeah, and actually in, Danica, are you talking? You're on mute if you are. Oh no, she was talking to someone else. <laughs> um, um, they actually, what was I gonna say about, not about glitter, glitter. not about glitter. Oh no, no. In, in breweries where they really, you know, make a lot of sour beers, but they also make other beers, they actually have almost like clean room standards for the fermentation of where their sour beers are fermenting, where it's like literally like the barrels stay over there, nothing like no same equipment is used or nothing is cross contained completely like different buildings miles apart yeah <laughs> yeah well, there was one in Asheville clean your shoes line. off before you step inside this brewery if you've just come from that brewery. there's a brewery what's the big brewery in Asheville North Carolina um they had the Funkatorium was their sour beer bar and their sour oh, beer uh, and then they had their stand they just sold to a big 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 brand recently um that's why it's left my brain I can't think of it yeah that's that's why we don't know what it's called anymore Fair enough. Um, but yeah but they had a whole different like brewery essentially for their sour beers and then another one so it is yeah it's like glitter that's remarkable that it's that the apricots and the plums and the tangerines were not co-fermented yeah how long are they kind of in contact like how long is this finishing ferment mm -hmm. nectarines not tangerines 
Thank you. We're talking, you know, tangerines and, 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 and nectarines. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> um, thinking about apples and oranges and the citrus component. He got, um, he got his third cider. He got yeah. his third cider. <laughs> and the got... only the only reason that I don't bring citrus, for example, uh, up into Finn River uh, has to do with regional sourcing. It doesn't grow near here. Sure. So there are uh, a lot of pretty rad ciders that are being produced um, that have things like lemon peel and grapefruit and oranges and tangerines. Um, it's just far away from me. And so those things don't grow here, but I'm, I'm quite intrigued. And I've had a number of conversations being like, well, what about all of these like um, frosted oranges that came out of uh, Central California? Um, there was a, a bad frost three years ago uh, that just basically dropped a ton of fruit, but the juice ends up inside was still full of sugar, but the fruit wasn't gonna be uh, uh, visibly acceptable. Anyhow, I don't mean that it's like a poke so much as like, yeah, tangerines. Uh -huh. yeah. I, day, I daydream about I that. Wish. Mm -hmm. Gotta come down to Arizona, get your citrus. Um, the uh, uh, contact time, I guess it varies a little bit. We let it sizzle and, and we let, so the sugar that you're tasting, for example, um, is sugar that we added back. Uh, and, and so we're, we're back sweetening with organic cane sugar. Uh, so what you're tasting is not peach or nectarine or, or plum sugar. We're letting that ferment through. So that takes about a week, week and a half. Uh, and we're dumping whole chunks of fruit in there. It's been frozen. So all the skins or all the cells have kind of like broken. Uh, so it floats and it makes this kind of like cheese flotilla of soft fruit pudding paste. Um, and you can, you can touch it and like, you know, smear it around and kind of just, mm. um, and that fruit floats in this cap on top uh, and we don't stir it, we don't deck it back down, we just let it ride. Uh, and, and so once it's on top, we'll pull all the cider out from underneath it. And that little bit of sizzling fermentation uh, from the last little bit of sugar kind of feeds the wild organisms right at the end and we get just that much more funk added to it. If you'll notice, I mean, I notice because I'm sitting here talking uh, a whole lot, but uh, the viscosity of the mucus in my mouth is different now than when it was when I was drinking the dry hop. For sure. uh -huh. And so I'm like, mm -hmm. right? That action is real. Um, and that is coming from uh, polysaccharide chains that are created. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, that are created by uh, pediococcus and lactobacillus. And these are things that change the body and the texture of wine, beer, and cider. And so we're using these organisms to create a totally different experience. Uh, and so I'm feeling that. I get it. We're talking about the body, the finish, the, the structure of the wine. Um, yeah, it's real. And we're impacting that. So if you go back to the dry hop um, and, or the, the fresh hop and, and you drink that, it's crisp, it's edgy, and it's thin. Um, and then you go into the Pullman Stone and you're like, oh, that's fruity and it's round. Oh yeah, and it leaves a lot going on here in your throat, here on the top of your mouth. Um, I, I think anyways, that I get to play. Um, I'm crafting that experience for you. I'm showing you a different way for your mouth and your body to experience a glass of cider. In this case, it's got apricots in it. And in this case, it has hops in it. Uh, and we're gonna dance back and forth. Um, and, and you're going to be able to uh, experience the variety that we can put on the table for you with a fair amount of intention. Like, uh, I'm not totally making this stuff up. I do pray, you know, to the agricultural cider gods from time to time to make sure that I'm in line with what they want from me. Uh, but we're trying to show you things and we're trying to take you on a trip. Uh, and it's sometimes it's about what's in the bottle and sometimes it's about what's on the farm and sometimes it's about social justice in the world um, because we're just humans moving through this space, trying to figure out what it is that we're supposed to be doing. Cool, yeah. These are really quite quite lovely, but not that I'm surprised. We've, every time we have been River Ciders, they're really great. I'd love to hear, Jay, Danica, Griff, I'd love to hear you know what you guys are thinking of these ciders and yeah. if you have a favorite or if you have any questions or anything like that. I think it's really funny that you hesitantly mentioned the tailgate situation because I'm only drinking one of them tonight because the Chiefs are playing on Saturday and I'm going to make everybody that we're going to watch with try the other two that we have <laughs> while we watch the game. So good, good job. Spread the Finn River love. <laughs> the Finn audience, I guess, with that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one but, did you drink tonight, Danica? Um, this was the fresh hopped, which I love it actually. It's so good. I haven't, I'm not Cider is something that I'm still 
learning. I don't feel like we have a ton of cider around here. I'm in Kansas city and there's not a lot of like cideries and stuff around here. So I don't feel like it's something we see as often, but a lot of breweries will have like a cider or something, which I don't feel like is the same. So, um, this is really good. I'm a big fan of this one. I am a big fan of sour beers usually too. So that was fun to hear you talk about that. And I'm excited to try the sour one. Yeah. Um, because I'm a big, usually a big fan of sour beers. Cause I like to taste like the fruits and stuff like that. So, and not only the fruit, but like this one's so complex, Danica, I think you guys were going to really like it. It's, it, it does have like, when I said Stilton, not far off. And there's also like the this yeah. toasted, like hazelnut character going on to it that I don't know, Andrew, do you associate that nuttiness with the actual pit or do you put the pit in there? It's frozen fruit, I think, right? Uh, right? Yeah, I would hope that most of the pits have been taken out. Um, okay. I, uh, I actually really like apricot pits. Um, if you crack them open, there's the bitter almond that's inside, which is the flavor source of almond extract and marzipan. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Yeah. Side note, uh, there was this one year when I got a five gallon bucket full of only apricot pits from uh, Tonemaker Hill Farms and I sat there and cracked them all. And I had a giant pile of bitter almonds on my table uh, and, and I was just like breathing them in and eating them. And it was a dare with my daughter uh, to eat them because they're kind of like bitter and uncomfortable. Uh, when you, I would when be toxic you know, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> maybe, I mean, yeah, sure, slash slash amazing um, and, and you know, the earth giving you a great gift. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're keeping the pits out for sure. I think <laughs> that that nuttiness for what it's worth um, is it, it's not acid aldehyde, um, but it's the buttered popcorn flavor. Uh, maybe it is acid aldehyde, acetyl, acetyl aldehyde. Um, the, from, that you get from, from a malolactic fermentation. Yeah, yeah, and you get as a beer flaw, like it's a very common home brewer mistake. Right? Like, um, you get Diacetyl. you get that nutty popcorn flavor thing. Diacetyl, there you go. Um, thank you. So what we're what I think we're talking about is diacetyl that's been produced by lactobacillus organisms. And if you get it at threshold, it's really quite delightful, and it adds depth, and it gives you some nuttiness and some and and some kind of deeper biscuity notes. Um, and then if you go overboard with it, when you breathe out, it tastes like. Uh, uh, popcorn kernels, and if you get even worse and stronger than that, you're 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 wondering if you're drinking something like butter beer um, and, and some some Harry Potter concoction kind of thing. Uh, and so there's a balancing of flaws, and I guess that speaks to it. Is that like yeah, um, if you tasted that nuttiness, I think uh, in a cleaner cider, you would identify it immediately as a rookie mistake um, or a contamination, and instead. What we have uh, is a balancing of flaws to make, uh, you know, these things are so bad and now they taste so good. Um, or you can threshold with where you get a little, you don't taste any Brettanomyces in this. I definitely put it in, but the organism did not produce the three components that it makes that taste like horse sweat and leather uh, and, and polyvinyl, right? Those are the notes that you're gonna get from a Brettanomyces contamination. And I wanted that and I, they don't show up and it's hard to make them show up in cider in a consistent way. Uh, and so it doesn't taste like Band-Aids, just so you know, I was trying and it didn't work out. Um, I was trying, and... I was aiming for Band-Aids <laughs> to go that way. Uh -huh, it, is, uh -huh. it is interesting, the more like I, I come to understand and learn about fermentation in general for Brettanomyces, you know, lactobacillus, any kind of fermentation, the inoculation that you might put in there and even the stuff that you can recognize in the environment around there have uh, less than, I, I, I think it was proposed that it was like less than a 70% likelihood that that same one that you inoculate with is going to be the one that completes the fermentation. fermentation. And you're just like, I'm hoping I'm rolling the dice and this is what I'm putting in there. It's nice that they're not too expensive. Uh, you, can, you can throw cultures uh, upon cultures. The neat thing is when you start throwing weird farm implements into the cider, uh, trying to see what, what, what you'll get. So like, you know, the old shovel that you found out there, you cut the handle <laughs> off and you split the, the, the wooden handle with a hatchet and then you can throw those as staves uh, into your cider. See if that would get you from if you think about uh, the old family paddle uh, in the Norwegian beer making tradition where the, the family paddle sat up uh, above and you would use it to stir and inoculate, I think that's some history of some sour beer kind of fermentations, right? That's where the yeast were. 
lived. That's better than like yanking your beard and then washing your hands in the liquid. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll keep it tidy. Uh, we did make a, a field of hay cider at, at one point where um, the farmer that uh, leases some land from us uh, had a fresh cut bale of hay that came in early spring um, because of a weird rotation of crops. And so this was before flower heads had formed. And so I had a gluten-free bale of hay. Uh, and I took that bale of hay and we shoved it into some cider uh, and, and we gave people a taste of like mowing lawn. Like it was, it was a beautiful bit of like grassy wildness on some good cider. Uh, and, and it tasted like you had just sliced, uh, uh, like you had just run your lawnmower over like the freshest cut grass. Uh, and it was subtle and it was an out breath and it was delightful. Um, but this idea of introducing a uh, variety of flavors to the game, cider also has a lot of flexibility. Um, because we don't have those rules like they do in France, because we don't have standards, <laughs> um, we get to make our own standards. And it's up to me to convince you all that uh, Finn River has standards and you can trust us. You can trust me to not do terrible things to you. Um, and, and that's the, the, the gameplay in the world, I think, is that, uh, you know, excellence is coming in somewhere. Um, yeah, Field of Hay is available. It's delightful. Artisan Hay. I know there's uh, some artisan kindling around. Um, but the uh, artisan hay or the craft bale of hay, mm -hmm. those are real things. Artisan hay, I love it, I love it. Hey Griff, did you have anything you wanted to chime in on what you're thinking over there? I, I, I beg to disagree on, on this a little bit because actually I smell leather in here. Oh. When, I mean, there's some leather in here uh, and so, it's it's really nice, it, you know. It's with well, the the whole thing is 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 really nice. And and here in Georgia, uh, I'm in LJ, Georgia, and LJ is in Gilmer County, and Gilmer County uh, considers itself the apple capital of Georgia. So we actually grow a lot of apples up here. There are apple houses all over the the county, and uh, th there are now some a couple of cideries that are making cider. So. Um, it's it's growing up here in terms of of cider and uh, and uh, I, I was real interested when I got the the ciders as well because the farmstead is interesting because I actually our street address is on Farmstead Road so we actually uh, have a, a farmstead connection with the farmstead cider. Oh, that's great. Sounds like that bottle should turn into a little a little bud vase or something to keep <laughs> around the house. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it, these these all have been these these have been great. Um, I, I really like the the uh, the, the palm and stone. I, I really do. Yeah. I think that there are numerous ways to present peaches and, and apricots and stone fruit uh, into the world, and oftentimes you see it in like bourbon barrel peach. Uh, uh, or uh, sure. things that are like sweet peach tea, and, and they go, uh, for my taste anyways, a, a fair bit overboard and just like blowing you out of the water. Uh, I want you to be able to drink a full pint. And then right. I want you to be able to go back to the bar and get something else and have a really lovely evening. Um, I don't want to blow you out. I don't want to fill your belly. I don't want to ruin your existence kind of thing. Um, and so this uh, uh, notion of a subtle peach or a subtle apricot in this case, like, yeah, there's a lot going on here, but I'd like to think at least in, in, in my world, um, this isn't overwhelming and it's not gonna be the, the end of your evening. It's gonna be a delightful moment um, that you can move through um, and that you could throw some cheese at, or you could throw some baby back ribs at. Like it kind of, it, it depends on what mood you're in and where you're at in terms of like making a crowd pleaser or making something like austere and far away and difficult to get at. Um, yeah, we have an issue here in in North Georgia with there are a lot of wineries here as well now, and uh, uh, most of them are on the way sweet side, and yeah. so uh, they they become real overpowering, and and uh, a lot of the wines. Uh, and I haven't I haven't tried any of the ciders here locally yet, but uh, uh, I I would guess that they may also be if they if they've done anything with fruit or whatever they're probably going to be a little bit overbearing but uh but you know really nice. to the point um sugar cells 
uh, and, and as many people come to the table and say, hey, I like a dry, a dry wine or a dry cider, and then they're going to walk away with like one of the sweeter things on our lineup, um, right. it's hard to get away from. Mm -hmm. And so finding your local operation that is going to make something that hits that mark, it, it, it's truly amazing when you get there. Um, there's a, a number of local breweries up here near Port Townsend. And, you know, from my perspective, it takes a fair bit of beer to make nice cider. And so as I go out and I hunt for my beers, um, I'm looking for a specific something. I'm looking for something that's dry and crisp and edgy. And I want to be able to have that. But I acknowledge that what I want isn't necessarily what's going to make a ton of money for the brewery. And so you got small businesses balanced on consumer preference. And yeah, sometimes it's hard to find something that feels dry uh, or is dry and complex at the same time. Uh, I did a quick search, uh, Brick River Cider Company. Uh, and is, is there in Kansas City. There's also one called the Summer, Somerset Wine and Cider Bar. Um, just as a, a, a throwback here, this is not in Georgia. Um, but the Somerset Wine and Cider Bar, Somerset is a region of England that is known for their country bittersweet ciders, uh, highfalutin. Uh, and, and so if you're looking there in Kansas City being like, where are the cider houses? Uh, it's true, only three popped up when I went looking. Uh, at the American Cider Association uh, 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 map finder kind of notion, I would gravitate towards the one that says Somerset. Um, Somerset is an incredible region of bittersweet, tannic, crazy apple people uh, in, in England, um, and they're making something amazing there. And so if that's what their focus is, I bet you're going to find something that is less angry orchard and a lot more craft showing up in a place like that. I do not yeah. have that kind of support for Georgia. Yeah, yeah. and Griff, I, I, I would say, you know, for the wine industry and, and for cider industry too, I feel like as alcohol industries start off in regions and start to like get their steam, sugar covers up a lot of flaws, you know, oh, yeah. sugar, makes things, sugar makes things palatable that otherwise wouldn't be. So while, you know, winemakers and cider makers are figuring out like what grapes grow here, what do I do with these grapes, what are like, I think that's common that things kind of start out a little bit sweeter. And then as they get their groove and they figure out like, don't plant those grapes here, don't work with that here, they start to like find their, you know, their spot. And yeah, go ahead. And I was gonna say, and culturally, uh, and this is from a little bit of time that I spent there, my, my grandparents uh, retired to Florida as many grandparents do. Um, but more, more recently, I spent, the last 10 years doing wine tours in Napa and Sonoma and met a lot of people from Georgia and other parts of the South. And I always could tell without them even telling me, not because of an accent or anything like that, but because when we would sit down for lunch and they would order iced tea, they would specify <laughs> unsweetened iced tea. And you don't have to say that. Anywhere else. It, here. <laughs> Anywhere else. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're from the South. You do. Yeah. So the palate there is much sweeter for yeah. sure. Yeah. Right. And we do have one winery uh, here. It's the Buckley Winery. Uh, and they make a, a an apple wine, which is dry, crisp, and very delightful. Cool. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, done with uh, a lot of Georgia fruit, too. So very nice. Now, you know. just, to, just to clarify, if you're familiar, do you know, is this grape juice and apple juice? Because apple uh, wine can kind of mean both sometimes. Both. It's, it's a little both, I think. I think there's uh, probably grape and apple with, you know, okay. in making this wine. Yes. Got it. I, uh, we've been trying to keep up with the Californians, uh, is how I see it. For what it's worth, I'm born and raised in Southern California. Uh, and what I'm noticing in the Sonoma area, in the you know wine country of California, you also have a, a handful of cider makers popping up, and they 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 tend to self-describe themselves as rebels, um, and, and you know they're they're non-winemakers, they're making alternative alcoholic beverages, and they're not sourcing grain from the Midwest or anything like that. And so you've got these uh, uh, folks um, at Tilted Shed is really who I'm referencing. Um, yeah. who are making a bunch of hybrid things where they're doing co-fermentations of grapes and apples. They're doing co-fermentations of plums and apples, and they're doing it on dry farmed fruit and 
uh, uh, no, you know, no irrigation, whatever it is that's showing up in the land, that kind of framework. And they're making boutique bottles of amazing uh, fermented beverage. And you can call it wine because it's alcohol from fruit. You can call it a hybrid wine because it's alcohol from, uh, from apples and grapes. Uh, but there's a, a, a number of definitions that are being broken right now by cider makers who are putting novel notions out into the world. Finn River does some of that. Uh, we don't sell it broadly. It's part of our club. Uh, I will shamelessly pitch. Um, yes, thank you. It is quite okay. punk. Um, I will shamelessly pitch that we put our new releases into our club first. Um, and that's the framework there. We're going to show you the best of what we got uh, uh, in our club members to make sure that they're seeing the avant-garde of our cider production. Uh, but in that same framework, we're we put out, uh, I think I bought in 300 gallons of Roussan grape juice from the Yakima Valley this last year, yeah. and we co-fermented that with peri pears. Nobody really knows what peri pears are. They're not broad spread. It's not a consumer concept that people understand. These are weird little pears that we grow because we make weird little batches of wine out of weird little pears, and then we tell everybody about them. Like, it's bizarre. And instead, we're going to combine them with grapes, and then we're going to tell you about that. Um, and so in, in that framework, yeah, you bet um, we're playing the game, whether it be peaches, whether it be pears and grapes together, there's a framework for it. And you know who doesn't have the like bureaucratic binds that the beer world and the wine world have? The cider world. Yeah. Uh, we and have freedom. <laughs> real testament to what the question was that Suzanne posed earlier is like, how important is it in this kind of relatively nascent industry in the United States, at least, of having the freedom to really kind of uh, let producers come into their own before they start slapping labels and creating definitions that are restrictive. Yeah. Uh, and I think it, it's a really important kind of point in time for the cider making industry to like take a breath. Like I know it's not necessarily super helpful for the consumers right now to have not have everything yeah. set in stone, but, but it really is going to allow for the creativity that will potentially make some really cool stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, Andrew, if you're familiar with Tilted Shed, you might be also familiar with a winery that's doing a similar thing in the other direction. I don't know much. Yeah, um, Kibblestadt Cellars, also in Sonoma, they make a Gravignon Blanc. So Gravenstein apples with Sauvignon Blanc. It's quite fun. Yeah. Yeah, Good stuff yeah they too. do cool stuff, for sure. The Californians are super fond of that Gravenstein apple. They, they do. Sure they do seem to think it's amazing. They yes. Sure uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I've seen that, and uh, uh, to the same notion, like there's a framework for novelty, um, and there's a framework for experimentation, and then there's connoisseurship. And so, how do you walk the line between not facilitating a waste of your time and a waste of your money, as well as facilitating the creativity? Um, and so there's, I feel like there's a commitment there. And that is where brand recognition and brand identity comes back into it uh, and, and relationship. And so, you know, I don't necessarily trust every cider company out there uh, to be making something that I think is going to be amazing uh, because their cider maker came up with some novel combination that blows my mind. Uh, I don't know that it's going to taste good. Is it worth my money? I make the same uh, uh, question about you know, 90% of the bottles of wine that I'm looking at in the grocery store. Uh, I don't have a relationship with the winery itself. And so I'm guessing about the wines that they're communicating, you know, so how are they communicating with me when I'm there? What's on the label and why? And all of that plays out for cider as well. Uh, and so, you know, setting expectations. Cider is young. That's very much true. And there isn't a lot of standardization. And sometimes you get something wild and you're like, this is this is not for me. Um, and that's great. And you should, I, I would encourage you to see that, I guess, as uh, a growth potential or a, a, a space of exploration that feels amazing, um, as opposed to a space of disappointment um, and, and wasting. Uh, and so, you know, so long as they're not uh, perpetrating something against you, the, the notion of someone presenting something new to your palate, something new to your brain space, that feels powerful. And I think cider has open space for that to occur, uh, both in the consumer, the, you know, the customer that's going to be consuming it, as well as in the fermenter. Uh, I try and walk that line myself. We are now a legacy company. Uh, we've been around for more than 10 years. 
and we're old timers in the cider industry. Yeah, for sure. Some of the OG. Um, um, it's funny because cider is young, but cider is also very old, right? I mean, yeah, you know, cider yeah. was the founding of our country, really. So it's it's an interesting dichotomy that this industry kind of has. Um, hey, we'd be happy to stick around and chat with you guys a little bit more, but just want to be respectful of everyone's time um, and realize that uh, we, we somehow are 90 minutes are in all of a sudden. Yeah. At the end of the 90 minutes. Time uh, flies when you're having fun and talking cider. So <laughs> thank you to all of you who are, are here and Andrew for your time yeah. chatting here with us about Finn River. So remarkable. Such These great storytelling. Great. Um, and so we can't wait for the next time we could hang out with you and maybe it'll be in person. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, come escape the Arizona okay. heat. <laughs> yeah, we actually have to head out. We've got a couple things to do tonight, but before we go, I just wanted to say my sister lives in Muckleteo, Washington, which is outside of, of Seattle. So we've already been like mapping out. I like already sent your guys' location to her and we've been like mapping out, like how can we make a trip over to Got you it. guys the next time I'm up there? Because it looks like if we include a ferry, it's only like an hour and a half. Or like two hours. Okay, let me clarify. It's going to be two hours to two and a half hours from anywhere. <laughs> the, the ferry system is uh, problematic at best. Um, <laughs> and if you need help finding lodging out here, you should send, I put my email into the chat. It's Andrew at Finn River. Um, it can be complicated. We are out here. It's worth it. There's a lot of other things to see. There's cool breweries. There's amazing lakes. There's incredible mountains. Yes, come visit. Mm -hmm. However, um, doing it as a day trip back and forth, um, pick a weekday, don't trust the ferries. Um, I'm trying to think of like a parallel in the world. It's like subways in New York. They go down all the time. No, the ferries are just problematic to build life around, um, <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, but at the same point in time, advice. Yeah, come on out, send me an email. If you need help planning, like I got that kind of space and time. And if I don't, I'll liaise you to someone in the, uh, at Finn River who can, uh, uh support general travel, so, uh, and <laughs> advice, that kind of thing. Um, awesome. Danica, tell us it's when cool you plan a trip. Maybe, maybe we'll join and yeah. we'll pick up Jay yeah. on the way. We'll all just have a little sip scout party live and in person out there. If we're going to have taking a ferry, that's more fun mm -hmm. with friends, right? Yeah. So the, if the yeah. ferry is <laughs> on, we're all just hanging out together. The Puget Sound ferries are like the opposite of Mussolini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The trains did not run on time and never will. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but often they serve pretty good beer in the galley. Um, and so you, what, what time you need to pass, you can pass it well with good friends. Um, uh, and I appreciate that aspect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you and it was so great to learn about cider from you. So we appreciate all of you guys. It was so good to see you. Thank you, Danica. Have a great yeah, night. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andrew. We really appreciate your time. Oh yep. yeah. Piece of cake. Yeah. Thank, thank you for all the information. It was great. Yeah, Griff, it, yeah, I put some notions, uh, Reese's Cider Company down there uh, in the chat. Um, if you I, don't know of it, it's not too yes, far away. Yeah, yes, you do. Do. all right. Yeah, I do know about Reese's. I, I've not been there yet. They, they've not been open that long, but, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's on my list to go go visit. I've seen three emails from them in general in the world of cider maker people. Uh, mm -hmm. And they seem to be putting together something that is focused on paying attention to the juice. Okay. Uh, and, and that they are uh, real people crafting a real thing. Uh, okay. So if you don't like it, you get to hold them accountable for it because they are solely responsible for what it is that you're going to taste. They've been, they've been growing apples in this region for probably mm -hmm. over 75 years, I would bet. Or Fermentation more. isn't that difficult. You know, people have been doing this for hundreds of years. They ought to be able to get it right. Exactly. It's by accident. Thanks for coming out tonight, Griff. Thanks. Yeah. All right, everyone, have a great evening. We'll talk to you soon. And next week, next month is wine and chocolate. And we'll have some fun two days after Valentine's Day on this again. And we'll see you then. Bye.